after the end of the Battle of Cambrai, Wilfred, uh, William Orpen, who was the most famous portrait artist of his age, and there's a very good collection of his paintings at the Imperial War Museum, visited HQ Tank Corps, Bermicor. Bermicor is about five miles as the crow flies from Agincourt, rather appropriately, and painted Brigadier General Hugh Ellis, DSO, who was the commander of the Tank Corps, and Major Elliot Hotblack, who by the end of the war had two DSOs, MC and Bar, and more wounds than most people could count. And he was the Tank Corps' intelligence and reconnaissance officer, and amongst other things, he becomes the Colonel Commandant of the Intelligence Corps uh, in the 1930s and after on that. And he painted a wide variety of war portraits, including, of course, Haig, and significantly, I think, just prior to his visit to Berbico, two young fighter pilots, both of whom would be dead by the end of the war, on that. And that's significant, I think, because the RFC, later RAF, of course, uh, it is an up-and-coming arm with the tank corps following it with about two years lag. Now, he wrote later, had a most interesting time. General Ellis is a great chap, full of go and a tremendous worker. Hot black, mild and gentle, full of charm. One could hardly imagine that he had all those DSOs and wound strikes. And as an aside, if you look at the open painting, you can see on the left sleeve of Hot Black, three wound strikes. He had probably something like eight by the time the war had finished on that. Returning to the quote of Orpen, Hot Black, who liked to go for a walk <clears throat> and sit down and read poetry, he said it took his mind off devising plans to kill better than anything else. And then there was the Colonel of the Tanks. He means, of course, JFC Fuller. Napoleon, as they called him. A great brain he had. Before the war, he knew his Chelsea well and the Cap Royale and all the sets that went there. Now, after the success of the Battle of Cambrai, the tank call might have assumed that his expansion was assured and that they were time to prepare, in particular, take on the new equipment that was coming in for an offensive on the lines of the Battle of Cambrai in the spring, as happened in 1917. Now, of course, these assumptions were wrong. The defeat of the Russians in the East in late 1917 gave Ludendorff, the de facto commander in chief of the German army, the forces he required for a decisive offensive on the Western Front before the incoming American army had completed its training and build-up. Ludendorff had some time to decide what he was going to do, but he eventually decided on a three-army offensive codenamed Operation Michael, which was to go from just south of Amiens to 10 miles south of Saint-Quentin, Saint-Quentin is centre right of your map, to seize the Somme crossings and then using the Somme as a shield, turn northwest to roll up the British army. The ground, which is relatively unchanged, is generally rolling countryside with few hedges, some woods and some significant villages and one or two towns and it had been devastated by fighting and by the Germans as they withdrew to the Hindenburg Line in early 1917. Ludendorff emphasized, I quote, we will punch a hole, for the rest we shall see. We did this this way in Russia, end of quote. The 56 specially trained infantry divisions, and I'll remind you, that's about the same size as the whole of the BEF, were to be preceded by an intense and very carefully planned five-hour artillery bombardment, which aimed to disrupt command and control, neutralize British artillery, and crush the British front line. One could anachronistically describe it as blitzkrieg by fire. And to quote the operational orders 
the first object of Michael I and II is to cut off the British in the Cambrai salient, known by us as the Fleckier salient. Look for the two red arrows coming together on the right hand side of my map and obtain a great tactical success. End of quote. The attack was to take place on the 21st of March 1918. London had to compromise between trying to it as early as possible and the problem that the ground needed to be relatively hard for him to be able to do the attack. Meanwhile, on the 3rd of December, 1917, Haig told his army commanders to prepare their troops through rest, training and preparation of the defence. Now, unlike the German army, which had the experience of both the defence and the offence, mainly on the western and the eastern fronts respectively, the BEF had little experience of the defence. It was therefore forced to adapt in haste. On the 14th of December, JHQ issued instructions for the defence with a scheme based on a German manual, the 15th of August 1917. Three zones of defence, the forward, battle and rear zone. The red forward zone, if you look at your map right hand side, was based on the current British front line and its backbone was supposed to be machine guns. The blue battle zone was usually to be one or two miles back and at least 2,000 to 3,000 yards in depth. Quote, if the enemy penetrated and the immediate attack of local reserves did not succeed in expelling him, a deliberate counterattack by corps or army reserve was to be launched at the earliest possible moment, end of quote. This was what clearly one of the key tasks of a tank call. These defensive tactics had appeared to serve the Germans well on the Third Battle of Ypres, for example, and help explain Ninth Tank Battalion's history, which is very nearly contemporary, written in late 1918, early 1919, that no one had the slightest suspicion that we were soon to be swept into the whirlpool of conflict. We had implicit confidence in the defences of the British Army, fostered by the tales of wonderful trenches, miles of barbed wire, masses of artillery, and thousands of infantry waiting eagerly for the first sight of a Bosch head over the parapet. For us, it was almost a case of another case of Nero fiddling while Rome burnt. In fact, third and fifth British armies were outnumbered over five, three to one in infantry, two to one in artillery, and nearly four to one in field and trench mortars. The tank corps faced additional problems of its own. After the Battle of Combray, the three original tank brigades, first, second, and third, moved to at or near Bray-Chu Somme, uh, center left of your map, and it, which is about 19 miles east northeast of Amiens and about six miles south of Albert. And they would have expected, as in 1916, to have had time to recover and to convert to the new Mark V and Rivet tanks. And in fact, Third Tank Brigade began its Whippet tank conversion training at Bray. However, with the unplanned need to support the defense, HQ Tank Corps faced a number of problems. The first of these was the Mark IV tank itself. Now, the Mark IV was an effective compromise between best possible performance and most rapid production. However, that meant a number of key compromises. The first was that the in-service engine was underpowered. And as a result, the maximum speed of a tank was about 3.7 miles an hour. And I have to say that was going downhill with the wind blowing in the right direction. The three in-service gearboxes that we use, taken from agricultural tractors, required three men to steer and turn the vehicle and change it. It could only manage just under one mile per hour in reverse with effectively only one gear. And it had a range limited to 35 miles. 
In addition to all this, the Mark IVs themselves presented a problem. Now, I know I'm in violation of the rule that says never show graphs in presentations, but I think in this case, I have a valid exception. Because the tank corps suffered very heavy losses during the March retreat. Several battalions lost virtually every single tank. In fact, the tank battalion actually did lose every single tank. And this slide is based on a very detailed analysis done by HQ Tank Corps just after the March retreat of the reasons for tank losses. On that, if you look at the graph uh, at the slide, you'll see on the left hand side, second tank battalion, equipped uh, Mark IVs. In the center, fourth tank brigade, equipped with Mark IVs again. And on the right hand side, third tank brigade, equipped with whippets. Let's deal with 3rd Tank Brigade first. Why does it look so different from the other two? Well, because it only had one battalion that was actually in action with whippets. The whippets were new, and it only fought one major action on the 26th of March. That explains its very low level of losses on that. However, if you look at the table, something odd going on here. The proportion of tanks lost by 4th Tank Brigade in the middle of the chart due to mechanical troubles of the rather garish purple is significantly higher, 68%, than 2nd Tank Brigade that only lost 18% of its tanks to mechanical breakdown. Why was this? Well, firstly, it's not to do with the exper relative experience of the battalions. The only battalion that was inexperienced was 10th Tank Battalion, which arrived from UK in early 1918, and notes that its losses are actually the lowest of the whole lot. The Tank Battalions in the two brigades, with the exception of 10th Battalion, were roughly equally experienced. Both brigades were fought extensively during the March retreat, and although 4th Tank Brigade's battalions would have had to travel slightly further, that doesn't really explain the difference. What about the commanders? Well, the newly formed 4th Tank Brigade was led by Hankey, a Worcester, and yet that is the Hankey, the man who saved the ba battle, uh, the British Army at the Battle of Gelevelt, and perhaps more significantly for the tank corps, he'd had a very successful Cambrai, probably the most successful battalion commander, commanding G Battalion. In contrast, the probably convalescent and certainly tank inexperienced officer in charge of 2nd Tank Brigade in early 1918 also had the disadvantage that he lost the brigade major experience foot on that. So it's not to do, and the same, if I did the analysis of the battalion commanders, it would be exactly the same. It's nothing to do with the quality of command in second and fourth tank brigade. There remains the possibility that there was some difference in the condition of the tanks. After the Battle of Combrick, 2nd Tank Brigade was brought up to near full strength, about 104 tanks, with 49 tanks from other tank battalions. But in contrast, 4th Tank Brigade only had seven tanks left after Combrick. 4th and 5th Tank Battalions are, of course, the battalions that fought at the Battle of Fleckier on that. And they needed 97 tanks all of which came from central workshops of the tank corps. Now that meant they should have been refurbished by central workshops, but it meant they did not come from other units. Now, despite the fact that they should have been refurbished by central workshops, the refurbishments were clearly not done very well. And we know this because the war diaries tell us that some of the tanks couldn't even be driven off the railway flats on delivery from Central Workshop. And also because 4th Tank Battalion kept a detailed record of what condition the 29 tanks it received. Remember, the maximum strength of tanks it would have held was 36, and it probably held 
somewhere between 32 and 34. So for 29 tanks was the bulk of the tanks that required. This chart, you don't need to worry about the detail, it's just chip quantity that's the important thing here. It tells you what was wrong with those tanks on delivery. The report says that only three tanks gave, I quote, no trouble. And the defects on the remaining 26 tanks were really very substantial. For example, 10 of the tanks required retiming, not an easy task on the Mark IV to get access to the engine, which was inside the vehicle. And probably much more significantly, on there, 10 tanks had worn sprockets or sprockets under line. The sprocket, of course, drives the track. It's therefore an extremely important component. And under no condition should have been, these tanks have been delivered to a unit with unchanged sprockets. To change a sprocket, and yes, I have done it, is not only a very difficult task, it's quite a substantial piece of metal, and it requires to be correctly aligned, but also you've got to break the track. The track weighs over a ton, and breaking the track is an extremely hazardous task, which is not because you have to use the sprocket to drive it back on, on there. So frankly, if I had been the commanding officer at 4th Tank Battalion, I'd have got my Wibbly out and tried to find a man running central workshops, and it would not have been for an interview with coffee on that. Interestingly, no HQ Tank Corps report, including Hot Black's report, identifies the problem, and the tanks issued to 4th Tank Brigade and up to this or tanks, and that suggests to me a poor level of supervision of central workshops and of the tank issuing process itself by HQ Tank Corps. It's worth noting that none of the officers of HQ Tank Corps, and don't get me wrong, they were very able and brave staff officers on that. Martel and Hotlack both become generals and well deserve to do so. Had they ever commanded a tank formation, a tank unit, let alone a tank. Now, on the 18th of January 1918, JHQ ordered HQ Tank Corps to deploy forward its brigades as follows. First Brigade to First Army, just north of Arras, in fact, near the Vimy Ridge, to be precise, on there. Second and third, but only sixth tank battalion, which had been re equipped in haste with Mark IVs, to Third Army, and Fourth Brigade to Fifth Army. Now, his memoirs, published in 1938, and the date is significant, Fuller complained that, I quote, in, in place of keeping the tank corps more or less concentrated, JHQ had decided to string us out sausage wires. End of quote. However, Fuller must have known that the reason why 3rd Brigade was in Bray was because it was converting the Whippets. The reason why 1st Brigade was up on the Vimy Ridge and not down in the area where the attack was likely to take place was that it had two new battalions, 11th and 12th, that had been deployed in haste in order to make space for 14th to 18th Battalion to form Bovington, and therefore needed further training in order to be used in action. That left the remaining six battalions of Mark IVs, which were within 12 miles of each other, concentrated in two brigades, 2nd and 4th Brigade, covering the Bapome Colbray Road and the key access to Peron in support initially of only two corps, fourth and seventh, respectively. The guidance, which was confirmed by a letter signed by Fuller and dated the 23rd of February 1918, was given to tank formations and units, I quote, that the principle to work on is concentration of force. Dispersion must be guarded against, end of quote. And the tanks were to, to be in general reserve for the decisive counterattack in the battle or the rear zone. At a conference on the 2nd of March, Haig echoed and confirmed this tank called guidance. However, 
probably as a result of a session of Goff, Fifth Army's commander. He also stated that, I quote, in certain special cases, however, where the ground is suitable, it is advisable to employ a few tanks from concealed positions on reverse slopes or in valleys as machine gun, mobile machine gun units. Now this so-called savage rabbit policy, that's Ellis's rather unfortunate description for, for this, violated, of course, the principle of the concentrated use of tanks, which is a fundamental principle of tank warfare. But let's be fair, given the slow speed and lack of maneuverability of the Mark IV, it could be effective. And this is demonstrated by Mitchell's Mark IV, which knocks out the A7B mix at the Battle of Ville Britain on the 24th of April. That's another presentation. If somebody wants to ask me a question, I'll be delighted to talk about it on that. And that is, of course, the first tank to tank in the military on that. The other point to make here is that only nine out of the approximately 204 Mark IV tanks in 2nd and 4th Tank Brigade were deployed in this savage rabbit mode. And, and this was on 4th Army's northern flank. Look for the four blue stars on the right-hand side of my map. And there was some logic to this because the gap between the front line and the main battle zone was fairly narrow because of ground constraints in this area. I think it's fair to say, despite Fuller's forceful criticism of JHQ, and that's putting it quite politely, actually, on there, JHQ actually followed tank core guidance with most of the tanks deployed in battalion or brigade concentration areas just behind the battle zone. Now, despite the small and decreasing number of tanks during the first days of the March retreat, the Mark IV battalions did provide some useful assistance to hard-pressed infantry. Now, time doesn't allow me to cover all games, but I'm going to concentrate on the most significant and representative tank actions. On the 21st of March, 4th Tank Brigade's four forward-deployed sections provided some effective support for the infantry. For example, one of these tanks actually fired 198 rounds of six pounder and 5,000 rounds of small arms in support of the infantry. The remainder of 4th Tank Brigade began to move forward with other reserves in order to support the battle zone. The North 4 Corps came under considerable pressure, and by 1500, the Germans had reached the rear of the battle zone near the village of Dueni. If you look at your map, it's top right of the map on that. Second Tank Brigade was in hides just east of Bapon and came under very heavy shelling. And that resulted in casualties, including most of 10th Tank Battalion's HQ staff. On the 21st of March, only 12 tanks of 8th Tank Battalion, that's the 2nd Tank Brigade, actually went into action. And they attacked into the battle zone as per the doctrinal requirements to retake the village of Dueni. A counterattack with part of 19th Division had been planned and rehearsed, but not over this piece of ground. In addition, by the time the counterattack started at 1840, which was nearly four hours after the Germans had reached Dueni because of the problems of communication, it was getting dark with mist and a confused action ensued. The German attack was held at the cost to 8th Tank Battalion, of two tanks and over 30% crew casualties. At about 1500, the next day, 22nd of March, 2nd Tank Battalion was told, I quote, the, the enemy has broken through the core line at Morshi, which is just left, when you on your map, and were apparently marching on Bunyi, which is left of Dueny, and Bumets, which is just to the right of Bunyi. The commanding officer, 2nd Tank Battalion, 
Lieutenant Colonel Bryce, DSO, or some of you might remember from our EMEA presentation, it's the same man, got permission by telephone from 19th Division to counterattack either side of Binney towards Merry Corps Wood and Mulshi, which are the top of the map I've just put up. C and A Battalion were to advance west of Binney towards Merry Corps Wood and Mulshi, respectively, and B Battalion was to advance east of Binney towards Mulshi. The tanks were to fill the gap between the left of 58th Brigade in Bernier and the right of 7th Tank Brigade, which is on the green line, the last prepared line system, and were to be followed by any available infantry. Bryce then briefed his company commanders, ordered them to move their tanks immediately, and moved with his reconnaissance officer, Captain Dillon, via headquarters 58th tank, uh, 58th Brigade in Bunyi to, I quote, the hill to the west of Bunyi. Bryce's quick action was typical of this competent, brave, he'd already run a DSO and would win another, and I have to say eccentric, he led a battalion picnic after his battalion success at the Battle of Cabrera, obviously. Bryce and Dillon arrived on their hill at about 1600 as Bryce's 25 tanks arrived either side of Bunyi. The tanks had moved three miles in an hour, a really quite considerable achievement for a Mark IV, particularly slightly clapped out ones. A tank commander, Lieutenant Colonel R. Watson Kerr, MC, describes being woken up at 1500, being told to move immediately. As his tanks got past Bunyi, he saw guns from four batteries of 256 Brigade Royal Field Artillery, and those guns would probably fire thousands of rounds by the end of the day, firing on open sights towards the advancing Germans. Not entirely surprisingly, the, uh, the gunners very politely cheered the tanks as they were going forward. The early arrival of B Company on the right was met by a tremendous concentration of machine gun fire. Shortly after that, a barrage and 20 to 30 German aircraft which knocked out some tanks. However, it had the virtue of diverting the Germans' attention from A and C Company on the left, and as a result, the Germans were taken by surprise, as was Watson Kerr. I quote from him again. There was a knoll ahead with hillier ground on the left, and I decided to leave the valley and take to the slopes. The tank began to mount it gently. Then suddenly, I looked like what, what I thought was the whole of the German army. In full mind, with banners flying and the harnesses of horses sparkling in the sun, they were coming towards us over the crest of a grassy slope several hundred yards away. Battalions of them against the distant hand skyline a swarming mass marching towards us in open country, in full marching order, in brilliant sunshine, with nobody apparently to stop them except ourselves. What a target. My driver and I could not believe our eyes. What's encouraged me sitting next to the driver in the front cab. The chief British histor official historian, Edmonds, praised, and I have to say that's a rare occurrence, particularly for tanks from Edmonds, Second Tank Battalion's counterattack. I quote, the well-timed attack of Second Tank Battalion had stopped the victorious Germans, probably 24th Reserve Division, end of quote. However, the tanks paid a very heavy price for this. 25 tanks went into action and only nine returned. There were 127 casualties out of a maximum of about 200 crewmen. And many of those casualties were caused by splash. Somebody can ask me a question about splash later on. Now, these heavy losses were, were a product of an effective German artillery response, despite the good support from the British artillery, the low speed of the Mark IV, the lack of infantry support, and probably because the tanks remained too long on their objectives. Now, by nightfall on the 23rd of March, 5th Army had lost all its defensive zones and had retreated to the Somme Canal 
and at Canal du Nord. Fourth tank brigade, which was supporting it, was reduced from about 102 tanks on the 21st of March to 25 tanks by the end of the 23rd of March. For example, 5th Tank Battalion gradually lost all its tanks as it withdrew and fought its way back to the Somme crossing at Brie. If you look at your map, it's right at the bottom of the map. On there. The last five tanks reached the bridge only to find that they could only cross in the railway bridge. And to do that, they had to push their sponsons in. All the, the British heavy tanks had two sponsons either side, and those sponsons were hit. But since the sponsons weighed over a ton, and in the case of a male tank, you had to wind the gun back as well, this was not something normally you did in a rush. Clearly, in this case, it had to be done in a rush. And that explains why only the first tank to arrive at Brie actually managed this. The other four tanks had to be destroyed the wrong side of the bridge. In fact, the commander of the last tank and two of his crewmen received the MC and MM respectively for rescuing two wounded crewmen, despite the fact that most of the bridge was blown both in front and behind them as they were trying to get back. To their north, second tank brigades, two remaining effective units, 8th and 10th battalions, withdrew to just south and northwest of Bapome respectively. To find Bapome, look for the marker that says Bertincourt, top centre of the map, and go left of that. And I'll talk about Bertincourt in just two seconds. Back at Bray, 3rd and 9th tank battalions were ordered to stop their whippet conversion and be ready for immediate action. 3rd tank battalion, which had just about completed its individual training on whippets, was allocated the 48 available whippets and 9th Tank Battalion drew the straw shore and became the first dismounted Lewis Gun Battalion. Now, I've got time to talk to you about Lewis Gun Battalions. I think it's important to realise they were quite a considerable accretion of firepower for the infantry commanders, because you've probably got about 80 Lewis Gun teams out of a tank battalion. And remember, there are only 16 Lewis Gun teams in an infantry battalion, so a tank battalion might have provided something like four times worth of fire battalions, of infantry battalions of firepower in terms of Lewis guns. On there. By, on there, uh, on there. Uh, and by the 24th of March, the Germans had breached right the way through the three main British defensive lines, four tank brigades, virtually tankless fourth and fifth tank battalions, also from dismounted Lewis gun teams, one tank, the fourth tank battalion, actually made it all the way back. None of fifth on there. Just north of Fifth Army, as a result of a failure to withdraw five corps early enough from the Fleckier salient, the determined German attempts to encircle it, and remember that was their key tactical objective at the beginning of the attack, and in addition to that, the normal weakness, because it was on an inter-army boundary, 2nd and 63rd Divisions, were by dawn of the 24th of March in an exposed salient centred on Bertincourt. The detailed map, and apologies, it is quite a busy map, but it's quite a good one. It's taken from Second Division's history. Um, if you go look right on the map, you'll see Bertincourt. The front line on the 24th of March in the early morning is the one that you can see curling from the north going round Bertincourt and coming down to bus. You'll notice that Bus, as I should pronounce it in French, had been taken by the Germans in the early morning before there. And so this is a very exposed salient with 63rd Division in the south and 2nd Division to the north of it. If you look at your map, you'll also see that um, 8th Tank Battalion is top left of the map and it's under command of 2nd Division. Both the infantry divisions had suffered very serious losses from gas in the Fleckier salient on there. And at 0900 on the 24th, 63rd Division began to withdraw from the southern half of the salient on there. And it was followed by 5th Brigade from 2nd Division, just the north of it, 
at 0915. Unfortunately, 5th Brigade withdrew too far back, and when 20 minutes later the depleted 6th Brigade came under attack from at least one and probably two German divisions, uh, it, to quote the divisional history, the situation of 6th Brigade was desperate, end of quote. Earlier that morning, 2nd Division had ordered 8th Tank Battalion to send two companies to make a demonstration against the Bus Barras line in order to allow 5 Brigade and 63rd Division to withdraw from the exposed Bertaco Salio. Uh, if you look on your map, you'll see Bus bottom right of the map, and Barras is just the left of it, just right of the red line on there. The third company of 8th Tank Battalion was ordered to support 6th Infantry Brigade on the Red Line. In compliance with the first order, at 1200 hours, two sections from a reinforced B Company moved to Barast, and 6th Tanks advanced east from Barast towards Bus under very little fire over hard ground at top speed, we might even have been doing three miles an hour with weapons firing through an enormous green field with bus in the distance. They, I quote, demonstrated towards bus to facilitate the withdrawal of 63rd Division, end of quote. As the five surviving tanks approached bus with low-flying German aircraft above, they came under heavy artillery fire, machine gun and rifle fire, and only two of these tanks made it back. Meanwhile, the 10 tanks of C Company went into action to support 6th Brigade as it withdrew under heavy pressure towards the Red Line. On the left, the north, five tanks moved towards Haplincourt village. Look, uh, top center of the map above Barras, you can see Haplincourt and below it, below it, and left of it, wood. And south of them, the five tanks, a further five tanks moved south of Haplinkor to cover the gap between that wood and Barras. Sixth Brigade reached the red line, however, all the tanks were lost to either artillery fire or mechanical problems. The tanks had paid a high price. <laughs> Only six out of the 24 tanks that went into action rallied, and 35% of the crewmen were casualties. These casualties are high, but I think we need to be fair here. They are comparable to those of the infantry brigades. For example, 2nd Division's infantry brigade suffered 39% casualties by the 30th of March, and 51st Highland was worse than that. 2nd Division commander wrote on the 1st of April 1918, there can be no doubt that the whole heightened support of the 8th Battalion saved us many casualties, and 2nd Division is grateful for their help and to quote the official history again, 6th Brigade had, I quote, in fact been saved by the 8th Tank Battalion on the right, which kept off any German infantry disposed to follow, end of quote. But as a result of this and other actions, by the 24th of March, only 10th Tank Battalion was left with a significant number of Mark 4s. To see further action in the rest of the March retreat. And again, time precludes me from talking about them, but if somebody wants to ask me a question, I'd be delighted to give you more detail. We left 3rd Tank Battalion and its 48 um, Whippet tanks, completing in haste its training. By the 25th of March, the Germans had pushed on to near the vital communication center of Amiens, bottom left of your map, and threatened to break through between uh, Amiens and Arras. To be precise, in the areas between Albert, which is center left of your map, <coughs> and uh, Hebutown, in the area of Hebutown, look for the two red arrows. One of them is pointing towards Hebutown, and the other one is pointing towards Colancon which is important to my story on that. The New Zealand Division and C Company of 3rd Tank Battalion had moved through the night to stop the Germans between Hibutan, Colancon, and the River Ankh, which is to the right of Colancon. 
Again, pick up the two red arrows. The bottom one is pointing at Conanco on there. Just before 1200, uh, sorry, a dismounted company, 8th Tank Battalion, just entered Conanco to stop the initial German advance. But it was the rapid, they could do over eight miles an hour, slightly faster than cavalry at the top, intervention of 14 Whippet tanks of 3rd Tank Battalion that was decisive. By the morning of the 26th, they were three miles south of Conancon. Look for the blue arrows on there. And they refueled at 10, by 10 o'clock. And after leaving orders for these companies to move as rapidly as possible, Lieutenant Colonel Charrington, commanding officer of the tank Battalion, and Captain Price, the officer commanding C Company, went forward by motor car to do a reconnaissance. They reached Conacon at 10.30, made an assessment, and returned to give orders to the Whippet tanks. Just before 1200, the 14 tanks of C Company moved north to Conacon to pick up the Blue Arrows, just as some infantry British was falling back in front of the advancing Germans. As ordered, the four sections of Whippets moved into the village, turned right, east, and the main street, and you can still see this time going on, doesn't, I suspect doesn't look that different than it did in 1918. No doubt some of the buildings have gone back up. And were then to turn uh, uh, left, hard left, to leave the village uh, and go northeast. Nine and 12 section were leading, and they were to turn as they came out the village right, southeast, and half right, east, respectively, to cover in the direction of the Hamel, which is off the map to the bottom right. 11 and 10 section, which were following them, were to, were to turn left, northwest, and half left, respectively, to cover in the direction of Hibby Town, which is just off the map, top of the map. As they moved through Colacol, a small body of British infantry began to fall back. The two lead sections, 9th and 12th, swung hard right southeast to follow to the north the edge of a small wood. You can see it on the map. Go past the Ferme du Bois-Brolet on there. And as they came round the edge of the wood, they took by surprise a party of 300 Germans advancing by detachments in close formation and about to enter the village from the east. The Germans fled, and in an action that demonstrated the relative speed and agility of the new Whippet tanks, and I have to say is reminiscent of cavalry action, 12 section pursued one group 2,400 yards southeast to the outskirts of Bouchonville, inflicted many casualties and took four machine guns. Behind it, nine section cut off part of the German force who surrendered to the returning infantry. The two sections then patrolled for an hour, but in the absence of further German attacks, returned to Colac Corps of 1500. Meanwhile, 10 and 11 sections behind them swung northwards towards Hibby Town, met few Germans, but helped clear up the situation. 10 section moved to in front of east of Hibby Town and helped round up German posts. An 11th section patrolled between Hibby Town and Serre and identified that the front in that area was held by the British, but it did create some panic in the British, on the British side because, of course, this was the first time the Whippet had seen an action. And it's given me a chance to talk about the episode of Martel. Martel was one of the staff officers, effectively the second in command on the staff side of Fuller. He arrives at a village called Serre, which is uh, about five miles northwest of Hebutel. He left his car there. He then walked through 51st Highland Division, which had taken by this stage over 50% casualties on there. And the officers of 51st said that they were okay, but they could do with some food. They hadn't had any for three days and they could do with some orders as well. He then continues marching his way towards Hibby Town, where he finds the remnants of 19th Infantry Division holding reasonably firmly Hibby Town, and that's key because it's on the purple line 
the last JFK defensive line, finds one of the brigade commanders, and then finds 10th and 11th section uh, of, with, with the whippets and tells them to go and assist the brigade commander. Uh, and he notices uh, some British infantrymen um, um, moving at speed in the wrong direction. Now, Martel was known as the slosher. He was a, 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 an army level boxer before the First World War. And I'm sure that the slosher used intellectual arguments to convince the British soldiers to stop moving rapidly in the wrong direction. Having done that, he then walked across to Krakow, met the commanding officer, Sir Akkanyan, found that everything was under control, and then simply walked all the way back again to get the other side. It's no wonder that Fuller said that Martel would make, take him to some places that made him very nervous indeed on that. The situation was fully stabilized by about 1530, and the tanks withdrew back to Kulakon. 18 Lewis guns, 18th tank battalion, garrisoned the village, and the German attempted victory in that area fails. And the next German attack is Operation Mars on the Arras area two days later, which is an abysmal failure. But that's another story, and that has nothing to do with tanks, by the way. On there. But the action I've just talked about was the first action of Whippet tanks, and it was, I think it's fair to say, a fair demonstration of the capabilities of the more rapid and lighter tank. And it would to be confirmed by the probably more famous action, which takes place at the Battle of Villy Brittany on the 24th of April 1918. And while 4th Tank Brigade went, the three battalions of 4th Tank Brigade, went to Flanders as dismounted Lewis gun teams, the remainder of the tank corps began the process of converting to the new Mark V and completing its whippet conversion. And the next major action that would fight is, of course, the Battle of Amiens on that, which I talked about in my last presentation. Thank you very much. And any questions? Jeffrey, thanks very much indeed for that. That was uh, excellent. Um, thoroughly enjoyed that presentation. And um, as, as uh, Jeffrey said, it's, it's question time. But before we go to questions, if we can just do the usual routine, which is uh, press the button uh, to raise your hand uh, as, a, as a virtual round of applause. And, and Jeffrey, I, don't, I, don't, I don't, don't think for a moment you can actually see the hands popping up, but there are hands popping up uh, rapidly left, right and centre uh, in, uh, as, a, as a round of applause. Right, first of all, we'll um, a good question from Mark Smith. So let me just uh, fire away. Hi, Mark. Hello, thank you for a very interesting uh, talk. I was, I, my, part of my interest um, is uh, the, the tanks moving uh, from the central workshops on the rail wagons. And you mentioned something quite uh, fascinating there that some of the tanks weren't even of the right condition to move off the rail wagons. Was there a shortage of parts? Uh, you know, why, why weren't these tanks reconditioned properly? I know they were relatively new technology, but the actual mechanical components weren't untried technology. Um, and you can provide a bit more insight on that, please. Yes, I think, well, firstly, not surprisingly, Central Workshop's history tells you absolutely nothing about this, right, which is, doesn't come as a surprise. But I think you need to place it in context. Remember, after the Battle of Cambrai, the planning assumption would have been that the Mark IVs were basically not going to be needed again as combat tanks. And they were going to be converted, and that's what happens to most of them. They were eventually converted to supply tanks, tender tanks, as they were called. And a lot of them were used for that purpose quite successfully, actually, until the end of the war. In fact, there are one or two Mark Ones, Mark Twos, and Mark Threes still being used for that purpose on there. And I think simply what happens is that there's a breakneck speed rush to produce these tanks. And clearly, the system just doesn't check them properly. It's not helped by the fact that central workshops did a major move. It's not, a, it's not a long move, and there's a major reorganization of the entire repair system, which I could bore you with for quite a long time, but I won't. And in essence, what they do is they take all the uh, repair crewmen from the battalions and transfer them to central workshops. This is all taking place in the midst of all this, 
So to be fair to central workshops, I think they're left with a with really the most horrible thing you could possibly get. They've got lots of people coming coming from battalions who probably didn't want to come from battalions. They're trying to reorganize themselves. They're trying to do a move and they're trying to in haste turn the ta tax back. But clearly something went wrong with the inspection procedure in this case on there. They appear to have sorted their act out by the time you get to the 100 days uh, on there because there are some tanks during the 100 days that are repaired four or five times and sent back and forwards. And although there's some complaint about the condition of the tanks, well, to do a tank four or five times, you wouldn't expect to be in marvellous nick by the end of that, would you, on that? So I think to answer your question, they were caught by something that came as a complete surprise. It was done in haste. Clearly, in the inspection system wasn't working properly on there. And the first indication it's not working is that you can't get the tanks off the rail flats. I have to say, and I do speak from experience here on that. So I think to answer your question, uh, everything goes wrong for central workshops at that particular moment. Thank you. Th thanks for your question there, Mark. Yep. That's great. You. Right. Paul, Paul McDonald doesn't have a video. OK, I'll ask Paul's question for him. Um, another brilliant presentation, uh, says Paul. Um, was John Hardress Lloyd the commander of the 3rd Tank Brigade at this time? And secondly, um, Paul would like to know a lot more detail if you've got it on the first ever tank v tank action. Yeah, OK. Uh, to answer your question, Hardress Lloyd was the commander of 3rd Tank Brigade. He was, of course, a cavalryman, so it was a very appropriate command. He's not the only cavalryman, by the way. The commander of 2nd Tank Brigade and the, and the commander of 5th um, Tank Brigade, Courage, were also cavalrymen. And most of the Whippet battalions had cavalrymen brought in specifically to command them and uh, further down the level on that. Um, on there. I'm sorry, I've just forgotten the second part of the question. The, the second part of the question was, he was uh, that Paul was asking about the uh, first oh, ever. Uh, sorry, I, 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 I'm, I'm just okay. rephrasing. I'm, I think what Paul means is the first tank versus yeah, tank yeah, action. Yeah, it's I, not quite yeah he, you mean the 24th of April. Uh, mm -hmm. and there's, that would deserve a presentation in its own right. But the, in, in very brief terms, the Germans launched quite a significant attack around Ville, Ville Britannia. And it's the first time the Germans used significant number of tanks, in particular, they used the limited number. There were only 20 ever produced A7Vs on there. So it's very important historic action. And that three British Mark IVs are positioned in a wood called the Bois d'Aquen. And one of them, the only Mark, male Mark IV, commanded by Mitchell, and Mitchell wrote a book about this, uh, which I commend to you, uh, on there, um, one of them uh, hits a, a German tank called Nix and knocks that tank out. The German crew claim they left the tank because of hand grenades in it, but frankly, I don't, I don't buy that one on there. And that is the first tank to tank action in history on there. And there is a whippet attack that takes place in the same area, which disperses two German infantry battalions as they're trying to attack. Uh, on breakthrough. It's, it's a really interesting small scale action. It's also famous because the Australians do an extraordinary counter attack in darkness, which successfully re establishes the line at that point. It's a moment of quite considerable crisis. And just in case somebody asked me the question, there is another tank to tank action in the First World War, and that is the extraordinary action that takes place on the 8th of October where British Mark IVs engage German Mark IVs in an, in an interesting action where the Germans suffer very heavy losses doing this on there. But that's, again, another presentation. Thanks for that, Geoffrey. I wasn't aware of the second action that you mentioned on the 8th of October, so thanks very much for that. We've got a, a, another question that's come in from David Bounds, but I uh, can't get David... Uh, to, to join us on, on the Zoom. So I'll read out the question, um, which is, um, I, I wonder if Jeffrey knows anything about a British Mark V that's on a memorial on a concrete plinth on a housing estate at Lugansk in the Ukraine. Um, and the picture, there is a picture of it, which I will share here. Um, can you see that? It's an interesting specialist subject, which I've got to do some more reading on. 
there were a surprising number of tanks sent to Russia uh, just as the war was ending. Uh, there were basically two lots. One lot was sent to Arkhangelsk, which is the reason why the Russians are the proud owners, or at least were the proud owners, of the only mark, uh, the only medium B that I know uh, survived the war. There wasn't a British one in existence. And there were a significant number of tanks. The French sent some from Renault FTs, and we sent uh, Mark Fives and some Whippets to the Russian uh, white forces who were attempting to um, overwhelm the German, uh, the um, Reds, uh, communists, who eventually won, of course, on there. And the tanks played really quite a significant role on there. There's a, there's a famous story about three Mark Fives taking Stalingrad. It wasn't called Stalingrad at the time on there. So the tank corps can take pride that, unlike the Germans, we did actually take, take Stalingrad <laughs> on there. Uh, and I suspect that tank, there was also a, a Mark V, I think, on a plinth in Stalingrad, which is now Volgograd. But of course, that was done in by the... Um, uh, fighting that took place around Stalingrad. And I think that tank is one of the relics there. The uh, Reds took over, and there is a, a specialist Osprey publication, one about the white tanks and one about the red tanks, which I commend to you, because that actually gives you quite a lot of detail about that on there. And the Reds may reuse both Mark V's and Whippets on there. They also had quite a lot of armoured cars on there. So that Mark V is one of the tanks that would have been a white uh, uh, tank before. And what's really surprising is that there is quite extensive documentary records on what those tanks did. And when I eventually finish writing the bit that I'm writing there, there is quite an interesting bit to be written about the performance of the tanks. There is some description by Fuller uh, in uh, copies of the tank uh, later on. So it's, it's quite an interesting little episode, quite significant one. Uh, thank you for the picture. Well, that was a, the picture was courtesy of the Long Long Trail website. So thanks yeah. to that particular website for that picture. Um, and thanks for your very full answer there, which I, I didn't remotely expect. Uh, so thank you, David Bounds, for, for, for asking that question. Gordon, uh, over to you. Thank you, David. Excellent presentation, Geoffrey. I enjoyed it enormously. My question is, would the life expectancy of World War I tank crew be greater or lesser less than the, the frontline man, the frontline Tommy? Um, it's quite a difficult question to answer because it's difficult to do a valid comparison. But what I can tell you, and I have tried to do it, the nearest comparison I can do for you is if you assume that all the tank corps casualties were tank crewmen, which I think is broadly speaking correct, if you look at the statistics, about 10% of tank corps casualties were not tank crews. So let's assume for the sake of argument that they're all tank crews. If you take the infantry, and let's try and find a, a comparator, and my comparator was the Canadians, because I thought that was a fair comparison. So if you take the Canadian losses and you make a few assumptions about they're always only in battalions and you don't worry too much about whether they're rifleable or not rifleable if you're with me in battalions, the Canadian casualty level looks as though it's about 90%. In other words, that 90% of infantrymen were either killed or wounded between the start of the 100 days and something like the 10th of October. Remember, there's an awful lot of fighting, and the Canadians Absolutely are right bang in the middle of it. Awful if you look at the death. equivalent tank corps figures, it's about 65%. I then sure. thought I need I, I then thought I need a, it's probably slightly less, but it's quite difficult to get accurate, absolutely accurate. I then thought I needed a control. So I thought, let's do the Second World War. Let's do Normandy. And because I had the figures for Third Infantry Division, which had done a lot of fighting, and the period of fighting between D-Day and um, 
the breakout in Normandy is almost exactly equal to the length of the Canadian one, their casualty level was about 65%. Really? To give you an idea of scale. Yeah, and third division uh, suffered something like, oh, I think it's something like 150% casualties in the, you know, in the between the Normandy landings and the end of the war. Never think the Second World War is less bloody. There's just fewer divisions doing it on them. Given the uh, answer to that question, were there any recruiting issues for crew to get uh, tank crew? No, no, there were none whatsoever. No, the tank crew had no problems recruiting volunteers uh, on there. Uh, but remember, by the time, by 1918, uh, they're not volunteers at any rate. They're post. They're usually posted. But no, right. there's no evidence. There's no evidence. There's any problem. You are slightly better off in a metal box than being an infantryman. And okay. a lot of the soldiers who go to form battalions like Tenth Tank Battalion and after are inf experienced infantrymen coming from France who want to do something different. Right. On there. So to answer your question, no. And if you want my gut feeling, and needs a lot more work on it. You are slightly better off in a metal box than you are in the open. And that is simply because the prime reason for being killed in the First World War, most conflicts, is artillery and mortar. If you're in a tank, if you're in a tank, you target targeted it specifically. If you're in a, a trench, it's just random, it, really. It, it's it? just it, well, it's what um, my ballistics experts used to call battlefield drizzle, which is a particularly unpleasant expression, but it does actually graphically describe what this is like. You've got a lot of shelling taking place, and that kills an awful lot of people. A lot of people. Uh, yeah. To answer your question, and by the way. The tank losses in the First World War, they're probably no worse than the losses in the Second World War. I, I was reading a very good description by a friend of mine about his father commanding a regiment in Italy, and there's some fighting there that is worse than the, than the First World War. Really? Look, yeah. yeah. th thank you very much for your answers. That's most enlightening. Thank you. Th Bye -bye. Thanks, Gordon. Thanks for that. Right, so we've got a, a couple of questions. A quick question from Martin Yem. Martin says, what is a magneto? What is a magneto? It's an engine, it's an engine component. Right, don't, ask, don't ask me what a magneto does. I, I'm, only, I'm only a tank core officer, please. <laughs> right, but the answer to your question is it's an engine component. That'll do. That. Okay. I'll leave a, I'll leave, I'll leave a mechanic to explain exactly what it is. Leave it at that. that that's right. fine. Uh, you know, otherwise, you might ask me what a carburetor is. I could probably do that one, actually. Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> You'd have trouble if it, knowing a, a magneto if, unless it came and hit you in the face, something like that. That's no problem. <laughs> OK. Um, we've got um, Julia Williams, who's uh, not got a video or a microphone, but um, Julia has asked... Um, how the Germans used air power in the engagement. Did, did, did the Germans bomb the tanks or pick their positions out for the German artillery, i.e. as spotters? Uh, I think the answer to your question is a bit of both. They, the Germans used quite aggressively, just as we did, I have to say. Um, in fact, the, the uh, RAF casualties uh, during the hunt during the um, march retreat are much worse than a tank call once as an aside on there they either attack using their machine guns which would probably have not much effect on a tank or they drop bombs on them which would have some effect uh, and i certainly know of at least two tanks which were knocked out and they would be knocked out by bombs they'd be, they'd be carrying small bombs but even a small bomb would be enough if you get a direct hit Quite difficult to get a direct hit, I have to say. Uh, I and can imagine it probably it, wasn't the, the easiest thing to do, but yeah. And no, but remember, the tank has no means really of defending itself easily because the elevation of the machine guns is probably not enough to engage uh, the uh, aircraft on that. On that, but you do see a lot of aircraft. I would make that point on both sides. On um, it's quite striking if you look at the stuff of the hundred days. There are many more aircraft than there are tanks in some of these actions. Perfect. Right. Paul, Pauline, do you want to unmute yourself there? Thank you. I'm struggling very much, sorry, with the structure of the tank companies. Um, I don't understand the difference between brigade and company. Right. I, right. I might 
right, is it right. in the case of compensation? Yeah, so in is the case it the same so as a brigade. Yeah, okay, sorry. Uh, I, one, one makes some assumptions one probably shouldn't make. Um, uh, the, you start with a battalion because that's basically the basic building block. A battalion will have three tank companies. Each of those tank companies will have, should have 12 tanks apiece in the First World War. Those 12 yeah. tanks are divided into four sections, each of which is supposed to have three tanks each. Sometimes there are only three sections. Right. Take a battalion, a, normally a brigade consists of three battalions. So if you start with a brigade, go the other way, you've got a brigade, the brigade has three battalions in it, the battalion has three companies in, in it, and the company has, uh, confusingly actually, four sections in it, because the infantry was smaller, and those four sections each have three tanks in them apiece. Those sections are commanded by a captain, each tank is supposed to be commanded by a lieutenant or second lieutenant, and a company is commanded by a major, in theory, sometimes it's a captain, and a battalion is commanded by a colonel, lieutenant colonel, and a brigade is commanded by a brigadier general in the First World War, brigadier in the Second World War on there. And then you've got division, but there are, there are no tank corps divisions. There are things called groups, but they never actually fight, which are above those. Okay, and there are five brigades, um, tank brigades, uh, by the time you get to uh, August 1918 on there. Okay, does that give you um, a rough sketch on there? The confusing thing is that a section is really a platoon-sized organisation. In, in I think I, I understand about the company and the section. It was the brigade that was confusing me. Yeah, you just go, effectively, you just go 3-3-3 three, three, three again. So you've got three companies in the battalion, three battalions in the brigade, and then if it was an infantry division, you'd have three brigades in a division on there. And then corps can have any number of divisions in theory, but usually it's between three and about five uh, of that varies. But they're, they're not tank organisations. And right. corps, in, in infantry corps, normally get a tank brigade in support. So at the Battle of Amiens, there is a tank brigade in support of the Canadians, and there is a tank brigade in support of the um, uh, Australians. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, that so, makes things quite a bit clearer. Thank, thank you very you. much. And very interesting talk. Thanks, Pauline. Thank Thanks, Pauline. Thanks very much. Right. So, um, Gordon's come back with an answer on the Magneto question. Oh, uh, thank you. Gordon says a magneto supplies electric power to the tank engine and will also charge the battery. So thanks for, for that, Gordon. Um, we've got uh, David Muir. Before I go to David, I'll just ask a quick question on behalf of um, Paul McDowell, who says it will, has got microphone issues, but he says, what anti tank, sorry, what anti gas measures did the tank have, please? Uh, well, the, the obvious answer to that is in the First World War, well, I say none. It's not, that's not quite true. Of course, they'd have the normal gas mask, which they carry with them. But it's not quite true. Curiously, the Mark IV was slightly overpressured. And if you have got an overpressured vehicle, and that's how, um, that means that the air is being pushed out, which helps keep gas from coming in. Trouble is with the Mark V, it was slightly under pressure uh, for reasons right. I won't bore you with, but which are to do with uh, uh, providing air for the cooling for the radiator. And that, of course, is exactly what you don't want for gas on there. And the answer to the question is that gas presented a major problem. And at the Battle of Villiers Britain, uh, the gunner, who's a sergeant who actually fires the rounds but knock out uh, a, the A7V Nicks actually had one eye out with mustard gas, because the Germans extensively used mustard gas in defence in order to deny the British use of woods, for example. And at Aken Wood, Mitchell's, where Mitchell's tank was, was absolutely saturated by gas. And mustard is horrible because it will, mustard will be liquid at some stages, depending on the temperature, and then it volatilizes and becomes a vapor. And of course, once it becomes a vapor, it then becomes extremely dangerous 
on that. And so the answer is that for really, there aren't any serious measures against tanks. You don't really see serious measures against tanks until modern tanks, for example, a Challenger 2, has quite an extensive filtration system. We don't see those until quite recently. Right, thanks. We've just, we've just lost David Muir, who was about to ask a question. I'll try and get David back, but if I can't, I'll ask his question later. Another David, David Bowley Booth, has asked this question, um, which you might be able to answer in the meantime, which is, what was the proportion of splatter injuries to others in tank crew? Um, and in fairness, in fairness, what I'll do, I don't think I'm going to get David Muir back. I'll link, oh, David has come back. David's asking about splash, so... so um... yeah, okay, good question. Good question. Uh, the answer is probably most of the casualties suffered tank crew crewmen was caused by splash. Uh, splash is the tiny little shards of metal you get on the inside when machine gun rounds hit on the outside on there, which is why a modern tank has an anti, have often anti splash almost like cushions on the inside. They are tiny. They don't give you usually fatal injuries, uh, but there is a magnificent description by Bayern, who won a DSO at the Battle of Cambrai, that he is looking into the distance and he feels what he thinks is sweat coming off his face, and it's not sweat at all. It's blood pouring down his face because he's been hit by the splash on the inside. And the medical records uh, on there uh, say that the majority of tank for lost uh, casualties, they're not, they're recoverable usually, except if he hit you in the eyes, was caused by um, a splash. Mark fives have some anti-splash measures, as do Mark fours on there. So there is a reduction in the amount of, gradual reduction in the amount of splash. As I say, modern tanks, you look on the inside, there's a thing that looks a bit like a cushion effect on the inside. It doubles up as um, an anti-splash measure. And the South African army, who was short of money, used chipboard <laughs> to, to do that. Not recommended, I have to say, but it does work. It, it did work, apparently, uh, on that. So that's what splash is on there. It's known as spall in modern terms, and you often have it described as an anti-spall line. Thanks for that, uh, Jeffrey. Sorry, David, uh, uh, you disappeared just at the wrong time. Uh, I think you, you, your internet probably slightly unstable uh, there. Uh, you keep coming back and forth. But um, thanks for that, David. Uh, David Bowley Bull did say, did ask what the proportion of spatter injuries to others were in tank crews. Uh, is there any data on that at all, Jeffrey? Yeah, according to uh, all the all it says is that most casualties were caused by splash right on right. there uh, on there but remember those were casualties mostly that you could just patch the bloke up effectively he was a minor wo wo wounded on there and these are not casualties that you would have to send back in most cases sometimes sometimes sadly they were blinded from splash but usually so to answer the question according to the to the records most of them are splash casualties, but actually and very few of them get evacuated right back as a result of those injuries. Great, thanks for that. Uh, Simon Bull's come in with a, a, a comment um, about this particular uh, subject uh, specifically, saying that Simon's uh, grandfather was in the tents in the First World War and his mother recalls um, his grandmother picking out little bits of metal out of him with yeah, tweezers and came to life. Yeah. Presumably, the splash would have gone yeah, into no, the skin and worked the splash. Out. And they're very small. I would emphasize the point. They're very small, which is why they don't do really serious injury. Super. Right. So thanks for that observation, Simon, on that. I think we're about there with the Q&As, in fairness, Geoffrey. Um, so, um, ladies and gentlemen, thanks very much indeed for watching uh, tonight's presentation. Uh, and many thanks indeed for, for the questions uh, and, Geoffrey, for the answers that you've uh, kindly provided. Um, if we want to uh, put our hands up again in, as a virtual round of applause uh, as a, for a final time, that'd be 
tremendous. Thanks very much. And uh, hundreds of hands are, are currently popping up on, on my screen as a, as a virtual round Thank of applause. You. So thanks very much for that. Um, next, uh, next Monday, we, we have um, um, Gordon Corrigan, um, who, who's going to be talking to us. Uh, so that's uh, another, uh, I'm sure it'll be another good one, um, as tonight's has been, but, but Gordon uh, can be spectacularly entertaining. So please do, please do uh, register for next, uh, next week's uh, webinar, which is about the Christmas truce of um, Christmas Day 1914. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thanks very much indeed for watching. Um, and I'll see everybody hopefully next week. Thanks very much. Thanks, Jeffrey. Man, was